NIMBY versus NIMBY, not in my backyard versus in my backyard. So who's the real expert here? The homeless know the inner city better than anyone. It's their home and backyard. Don't you think it's ironic they aren't being asked more often for input into design and urban design and placemaking? <coughs> Once upon a time, there was a perfect inner city neighborhood in Calgary. It was filled with perfect people with perfect lives. Beautiful parks, organic stores, drinking lattes, they all had kids or a dog. NIMBY. Everyone was perfectly happy until 2001. The drop-in center opened across the river from this perfect neighborhood, fondly referred to as the DI. It's one of the biggest homeless shelters in North America, feeding and housing over a thousand adults a day. Anyone can stay as long as they want. The perfect neighborhood voiced dissatisfaction. They spoke angrily about the DI, homeless neighbors, distasteful activities. I've used some of their quotes here in the presentation. Maybe you'll find yourself aligned with their perspectives. But I'd like to share a different way of looking at things. Maybe it'll shift your way of thinking. Let's admit it. New urbanism is really here to stay. But what is it? Aging in place, active transport, public places, recycling, eyes on the street, community. I believe our homeless live and breathe new urbanism on a daily basis. Don't we have something to learn from them? One perfect neighbor said about the homeless, these are really unpleasant people, with almost no exception. Addicts, schizophrenics, immigrants, dealers, prostitutes, shopping carts, tattoos, scary. No stereotyping here. Don't you think we should get to know our neighbors a little bit better? At the DI, people are aging in place. The majority of clients are 56 to 65 years old. In the last 16 years, clients over the age of 65 years has increased by 380%. Many have little education, and physical and mental health illness are common. Owning a car is expensive. The homeless have no choice but to rely on active transport. They walk, bike, and take public transit every day. They probably know their way around the city better than any of us. Their ingenuity in moving themselves and their belongings is truly astounding. Specific to public transit, it does more than just move people. It provides a safe refuge. It provides a place to hide from rain and cold weather. It provides a warm, well-lit place to read a book, listen to music, or be social. It's a place to rest. Here's Colin. He spends a lot of time in this plaza, reading, smoking, listening to his radio, soaking in the sun. He knows the best places to sit and watch the world go by out of the rain and wind. He's done his own environmental assessment of this public place. The success of public place is often measured by stickiness, that is, people linger and enjoy. So doesn't use by the homeless count? One insightful perfect neighbor said, I hope my neighbors agree that our public spaces are for all public, not just homeowners. Perfect neighbors said, the homeless don't have anything to do during the day. They can be perceived as lazy because they don't have traditional jobs to recognize their value. Binners, also known as bottle pickers or dumpster divers, make their living collecting containers from bins. They are one of the most marginalized groups in cities. But did you know? Binners work really hard often starting at 5 in the morning, working about 7 hours a day, walking up to 25 kilometers a day, and they earn about 25 to 40 dollars a day. They reduce, reuse, recycle. As one positive neighbor said, binners are actually keeping recyclables out of landfill. In 2014, the Binners Project started in Vancouver. It's a group working together to improve bidders' economic opportunities and reduce stigma. 
They promote a safe work environment. Given the nature of their work, binners spend their time in streets, alleyways, and parks. Eyes on the street. Let me tell you three stories about working together to make the community a better place. Sense of community, connectivity. Here two DI clients are volunteering with the Downtown Association and the Cover Your Butts campaign. They help by handing out anti-cigarette butt litter packets. And here, John was an addict who lost everything. Things turned around when he volunteered with preschool children in a downtown community garden. They grew and shared food. The kids looked up to him, called him Farmer John. Now he's clean and sober. So giving to the community worked really well for everybody. And then there was Lourdes, the rescue dog from Mexico. This is my personal story. She escaped through my screen window and disappeared into the night. As I searched for Lourdes, I discovered it was the homeless who knew the area best, all corners of the hood. With their help, she got home safe and sound. So, we're back to the original question. You've had some time to think. So who's the real expert? NIMBY versus MB? We need to design for diversity in our inner city. To reach this goal, I urge you to be inclusive in your work. I challenge you to create ways to include this MBI group of experts in your processes. And I just have to say a huge thank you to Jordan at the drop-in shelter in Calgary and the, the residents there for sharing their photos and stories with me and also to Liam for his guidance. And I know we're gonna have questions at the end today, but if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to email me. Thank you. So our, our next presentation is by Brian Gold. Um, Brian is an active transportation planning engineer with the city of Vancouver. Hi, so I'm here today to talk about Vancouver Cycling Spot Improvement Program, um, which is a kind of a quick response program to intersection safety and comfort issues, as well as uh, we sometimes tackle some tiny corridor projects. So the first project I wanted to talk about today um, is was one of the only locations along the 10th Avenue bikeway where bikes didn't have priority. So after uh, about a year or two of work, we got a four-way stop, people. Uh, and, and so, I mean, this isn't always pretty stuff, this isn't easy stuff, but this is a, actually a significant improvement in uh, comfort for people cycling as well as walking. Um, we've rotated stop signs, we've removed stop signs along bikeways, converting four ways to two ways, we've taken out traffic circles. Um, we've also got in um, and coordinated with some major infrastructure projects and gotten um, looked at, okay, where are people going to detour off of this arterial? Is it on a bikeway? Can we get in and can we do some very temporary uh, diverters? I'm not going to claim this is a work of beauty. I don't know if Ross is here in the audience to defend his work. Um, one day we'll have a, we'll have a nice uh, uh, cul-de-sac and, and do this up as a park extension. Um, this one you can blame on me. We were in uh, doing some utility reconstruction on Burrard Street. Saw an opportunity to address some rather high vehicular traffic on Cyprus, up in the order of a few thousand or vehicle trips a day, and they showed up at this intersection and were kind of turning every which way as people were waiting for the signal to change to cross the street. And so we came in and we put in a, uh, actually, it, now it's basically four partial closures within the span of two blocks, which is a, a bit much, but really tends to bring those volumes down. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, again, uh, not the prettiest thing in the world. Uh, so there's, there's future stages, perhaps, of, of fully reconstructing the street, trying to pretty things up. Um, but we weren't done there. Uh, Burrard Street itself needed repaving, and we saw an opportunity to do what essentially turned into a very, um, I don't know if fancy road died is the, is the word for it, but we did get a protected bike lane in through that. Um, so if you have a chance to ride across the Burrard Bridge, you can now carry straight south up Burrard. I apologize if you don't get much past 4th, we're still building it. Um, <laughs> And so there's also uh, these targeted safety improvements. So we've, uh, we have yield on turn intersections, we have protected right turn face intersections you've probably seen, and we've also got some turn band intersections. Um, there's a few locations downtown, there's also one we uh, just addressed at Burden Pacific where we uh, extended out the median. So what we were seeing is people were able to make these turns and all the signage and all the paint in the world only really got maybe 
a, a, a third reduction in the people making those illegal turns. Uh, extending the median re reduced um, those illegal turns by a further third, and that's where we really started to see the, the uh, collision reductions. It didn't really seem to be the people who knew what they were doing, it was the people who were doing it anyway. Um, and so at Broward Pacific, at least, we saw about a two-thirds reduction in, in collisions attributable to those illegal returns. Um, this is a more complicated example uh, at Hornby and Dunsmuir, uh, where previously both streets, the medians, just kind of ended short of the crosswalks, um, and we were able to extend the medians out to meet in this corner. Um, so again, addressing those right turn conflicts, um, but it goes beyond the right turn conflicts because previously Hornby and Dunsmuir, basically they, they touched each other, but they didn't connect. And so if you were riding down Dunsmuir and you wanted to continue on the protected bike lane network, you know, make that left turn toward the art gallery, you were sitting out in traffic just as, I, I can't show you more than one photo of the sequence, but that, that SUV is turning right illegally across the path of those people waiting to make that turn. And that is not a good situation for anybody. Um, so, I, I, again, with, with extending those medians out to meet in the corner, we created either what is a really, really good uh, two-stage turn box or a really terrible protected intersection. I don't, <laughs> frankly, I don't, I don't care which one you think it is. I just hope that it's better than it was before. Um, maybe there'll be some opportunities. We remove the Georgia and Dunsmuir viaducts and there's less traffic on Dunsmuir to do something a little better here in the future and we'll see what opportunities present. Um, so I was talking earlier about some tiny corridor projects. This is uh, about five blocks of Richard Street that needed repaving a couple of years back. And so we looked at uh, the widths and found that there was just enough room, like the bike lane was slightly wider than it needed to be, the parking lane was slightly wider than it needed to be, just enough room to put the bike lane on the correct side of the parked cars. Um, which works a lot better if you have parked cars. Um, so apologies for this photo, now it's just a really nice wide buffered bike lane, but that kind of <laughs> kind of speaks to when you're doing these things quickly, you're not necessarily looking at, do we need both travel lanes? Do we need both parking lanes? Could we instead have found the room for another direction of bicycle travel on the street? Um, and I guess the other thing to look into is, are you able to put a physical object in there to prevent people from illegally parking and also so that they've got some protection uh, when there isn't parked cars? Um, but Richards is actually, a relatively important connection now, especially since we've uh, put protected bike lanes on Smythe and Nelson Street coming off of the Canby Bridge. Um, so uh, it's, it's unfortunate that Smythe just kind of ends at Richards, but on the other hand, it gives you that protected option to, to keep going uh, along your way. Um, sometimes we do a project and then we keep doing projects at the same intersection. So this first iteration was to address a gap uh, between the east side chair path on the Canby Bridge and painted bike lanes on Beatty Street. So the first move was to put in a two-way protected bike lane, uh, both for the comfort of people riding in this painted uh, westbound lane, as well as to try and stop people from riding eastbound on the sidewalk, because there wasn't any equivalent facility. Um, so we put that lane in, and that was great. Uh, people could safely connect to Beatty Street, but what a lot of people really wanted to do was just ride up Smythe. Um, and as we finished this construction, there was a construction bin that was sitting in the curb lane, and that was, that was a really awkward part of my commute for close to, close to half a year. But it was this argument that, hey, maybe we don't need that curb lane for that first half block. Maybe we could put in a really um, short piece of uh, the, the lowest painted and baller, the lowest quality bike lane I've ever been able to put in and still call it kind of protected. Um, we were able to start dotting some elephant's feet across the intersection. The green paint was a little too far, but it was this, it was this starting point to communicate to drivers that there were people bikes going up Smythe. And it was also the starting point to argue that, hey, we can put a protected bike lane on Smythe. Um, and so after that facility on Smythe after uh, upgrading the painted bike lanes on BD to protect, uh, painted bike lanes to protected bike lanes. Um, we were also able to put in, uh, finally, a protected right turn phase um, because this was a very high right turn onto BD. It wasn't particularly comfortable for anyone. So what's next? Um, this is the intersection of Oak and 7th uh, in Fairview and we're about to start construction on some improvements here, both to improve the comfort of the crossing. Uh, you can see with the hill and the traffic, it's not the most comfortable crossing for cycling and walking. But it's also got that great view of downtown. Um, so we're looking at the opportunity to come in and uh, put in uh, some mini parks, put in benches right on the, the kind of view that you were seeing there earlier, really shorten up those crossings. Uh, once you get rid of motor vehicles during the intersection, all of a sudden you don't need those huge curb radii. Uh, you don't need wide travel lanes on the, uh, on, the, on the main street where people are just going straight. So we're gonna tighten that all up, reduce the crossing distances, and hopefully start that at the end of the month. So our next presentation is Chris Saliba. I'm sorry, that's incorrect. I'll ahead of myself here. I'm sorry. Our next presenter is Jason Fieldcoff. 
Um, Jason is a senior engineer with the Seattle Department of Transportation. Uh, he is also the co-founder of Hong Texas. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Um, so in my first month of my transportation career, I talked to my colleague and was like, you know, I'm going to start playing trombone again. And the following <laughs> week, he, um, his partner got me involved in a band. And we were up in Boston that fall playing in this, this community brass band festival. And later that year, we were out in Seattle doing something similar. And we said, let's come back to Austin and let's do this here. Uh, and we brought 25, oh, it's working decent. Uh, we have brought 25 bands from across the continent to perform for free in our streets, uh, parking lots, our parks, our public spaces, uh, and people just came out and loved it. And that's what we've been doing with these honk fests uh, in Austin. It's what's been happening elsewhere in the country and now spreading off the continent. Uh, we're transforming our community spaces through the power of music. Uh, and simultaneously, we're giving people this opportunity to transform themselves to enter the creative community, re-enter the creative community, and we're doing this in the framework of uh, as revelry as a part of a functioning uh, city. And I love this quote out of a pattern language. Just as an individual person dreams fantastic happenings to release the inner forces which cannot be encompassed by ordinary events, so too a city needs its dreams. Uh, in the United States, we look at New Orleans as probably the best example of this. I think most of us in the room are familiar with Mardi Gras, but second line culture in general where small community groups will hire bands and they'll parade through their neighborhoods and it's open to anybody. Anybody in the neighborhood can come out and listen to the music and walk with them. Uh, it's a long standing tradition in America, probably Canada also, I don't know, uh, where we use our public spaces to communicate ideas. I probably wouldn't include this slide again, but these they were due three weeks ago. Uh, I'd probably touch on Carnival in Brazil, where like this is something that's international. It's, it's woven into our fabric. Uh, this is an example of transforming public spaces in Austin, Texas. I don't know if anybody's been to Congress Avenue downtown. It's Texas's main street, and in that nature, it's a seven-lane arterial, and it moves a lot of cars. By programming a parade, um, it's not just bands here, there's participants. People can really start to imagine what it was like 100 years ago when streetcars and people, and it's Texas, so cowboys too, uh, in the street. It's, it's kind of chaotic, honk. You're, you show up, it's, it's let the farmer's market. Like, who is running this? I don't know, but it's, it's working. Um, and and it, 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 it activates spaces in a way that like sometimes we, we create things and I mean we, we're getting better at it but it, it, it allows people to come and see what they have available. So here's an example from Seattle. I don't know how many of us have been there. This is Gasworks Park. Um, it used to be a gas plant and it was I guess upcycled into a park and it's a very beautiful park. I would say that it's underutilized. Other people might disagree. Um, but by programming bands there, it starts to generate it as a community center. People come out, and, and we know it's successful because here, other places um, where we do this, there's now for-profit events coming in behind us with using the same ideas and the same language. Honk is different. Uh, it's not just transforming public spaces, it's, it's making music and these spaces accessible to everybody. It's eight-year-olds to eight-year-olds, and there's even a baby up there. I've never seen so many like senior citizens and children arguing over space um, to be able to be a part of it. And it's important to look at our festivals this way too, because a lot of times we go out now, uh, and and it's like a it's, we consume it. It's you pay two, three hundred dollars to stand in this huge crowd. Most there's a lot of people who will not do this, and you're, you're a quarter mile away from the stage and you're watching TV. There's two sets of speakers and, I mean, there's a place for it. I, I saw Outcast, it was awesome. But <laughs> like the, when, we, when we do this, anybody can come out, um, anybody can participate. And that's, that's really where we start to see these like, I don't, I don't, how, I don't think had that, that concept at first. And then people just started showing up afterwards being like, how can I start performing? How can my community organization get involved in this? Uh, in Boston, in Somerville, 
they created a school so that all year people who went to the event could come and they could learn to play music or relearn to play music alongside professionals, friends, neighbors, so that the following year they could come out and they could perform for their family and friends. Uh, and that, that it's different that way when you recognize the participants and there's no longer that fourth wall. You're, you're a part of it. This is the Carnival Band here in Vancouver. They do it every Monday night on Commercial Drive. You can go out, they'll teach you how to play music, and you can, you can go out and you can pray. I think this is a, the Chinese New Year, I'm not sure. I just pulled this picture. That's not to say Hong doesn't have its, uh, uh, its challenges. It's a hip event. It's really white. Um, and it, it makes this question, like, who are we activating our public spaces for? So. Um, iteratively, Honk has been being more deliberate uh, about reaching out to its underserved communities. In Boston, they partner with the unions and the working classes uh, to have a very activist day of action. Um, a lot of the Honks are deliberate about partnering with communities of color to have performances specifically programmed for underserved communities, and then going steps further to make sure that who's participating in the event are from these communities. And this is a great success story in Austin, the, the Danza Azteca group, where there was a huge language barrier. Um, but they came out and they lined up and we pretty much were like, all right, the parade's going. And it was, it was gorgeous and they came back the second year and the, the outfits and the costumes were better. Uh, and it, it, it's, it, it was really a success about not just transforming the street and the park and the parking lot, but giving people this chance to come out um, and be creative again. And there's, I, I think that sometimes we just forget uh, that it's nice to, to just be somebody different for a day and that that's like an important part of our cities. Thank you for your time. again for the name mix up. Um, Chris is up next. Chris Saliva. Chris is a design associate with Alta Planning and Design. Hi there, my name is Chris Saliva. Uh, I'm a landscape architect and I have a master's uh, degree in public health. Um, early in my career, I worked in sm smoking cessation um, at Brown University and Group Health Cooperative in Seattle. During that time, I worked with teens and adults um, to help them develop successful strategies to quit smoking um, using an evidence-based um, approach to behavior change. Over the last 11 years, I've been working as a landscape architect and healthy communities consultant, focusing on the integration of active transportation into urban design and transportation planning. So this presentation is going to highlight my experience and takeaways from smoking cessation and how they can be applied to the field of active transportation. Over the past two decades, we as a society have made a huge progress to help people quit smoking. According to the American Cancer Society, smoking cessation programs have helped more than two million people develop action plans for quitting. We can now learn from these successes in our efforts to help people use more active modes of transportation. When trying to quit smoking, there are a number of techniques that people use. However, <coughs> excuse me. Um, however, what has been found to be most successful is when people use a combination of strategies. So in smoking cessation, that includes policy, um, such as taxing cigarettes, medication, um, and developing and using counseling-based programs. When trying to get more people using active transportation, most discussions focus on infrastructure investment for safe streets, which is really important. But we also need to be investing and thinking about encouragement and education programs. The, our encouragement and education programs are really vital to helping people figure out for them personalized um, aspects of what works best for them. Ooh, here we go. In smoking cessation counseling programs, the stages of change model has been used to help uh, people identify where they're at in their willingness to change. The stages of change model um, is used uh, to assess and kind of direct people towards advancing in movement throughout their, their different stages. To give you an overview of the different stages, um, we start with pre-contemplation, where somebody might not be thinking about changing a behavior, or contemplation, where they're aware of their behavior and they may not be willing to, to change. Preparation, they're getting ready to change, action, they're actively trying to change, and maintenance, they're trying to uh, maintain a behavior. So in smoking, that's trying to stay quit. 
Um, self-efficacy. So within the stages of change, we know that self-efficacy and confidence is really important um, between these different stages of change. So for example, somebody in pre-contemplation is going to have has a lower level of self-confidence, while somebody in a more advanced stage, such as preparation or action, has more confidence in their ability to change a behavior. So talking a little bit more about pre-contemplation, um, here where it is an individual, an individual might not be thinking about behavior change. So what's really important here is while we're engaged in encouragement programs um, and behavior change programs is matching strategies with where people are in their willingness to change. So in pre-contemplation, it's really about education and, and, really, not, uh, and really coming in a non-confrontational uh, way. Whereas in contemplation, this is where people are starting to really think about a change. They've thought about it. They understand maybe the pros and the cons. So here we need maybe uh, to provide more education and then small steps. Whereas in, in preparation, somebody's ready to change. They're like, okay, I want to do this. I'm ready to, to take the next step. Um, and what does that look like? So in this stage, this is where we start getting at action planning, really developing strategies um, that are specific to individuals. And, and tailoring them to uh, their ability and their willingness to change. So what is an action plan? So on the smoking side, an action plan might consist of, all right, I'm gonna pick my quit date. I'm gonna identify my reasons for wanting to quit smoking. I'm gonna identify my triggers. I'm gonna fight my cravings, and I'm gonna get help with quitting. How does this translate to active transportation? Have we thought about, or have we ever talked about, um, uh, starting with picking a quit date, or pick, picking a date to start using AT, um, identifying my reasons for wanting to do that. I'm gonna jump ahead. Uh, quitting takes practice. So similarly with changing behavior into using more active tra transportation, it's not gonna just happen overnight. Um, somebody who's trying to quit smoking, it takes up to 30 times to actually quit. So it's not going cold turkey. It works for some people, but it doesn't work for everybody. I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit because I have a little time. Um, quit coaches. Uh, so in smoking cessation, quit coaches um, are professionals that have been trained using different strategies such as motivational interviewing. Um, and quit coaches are providing the social support that people need. Um, so for example, there are uh, statewide programs that offer telephone-based support um, and texting support. So my take on that is, hey, what about transportation coaches? There are programs that are happening um, that are using those techniques and using transportation coaches to help um, tailor uh, action plans. Motivational interviewing. So motivational interviewing is a psychological uh, strategy and, or technique, you could say, um, that is used um, as a therapeutic style to help engage and move people along the stages of change. Social support. So as part of your quit plan, um, tell people what you intend to do. Here's, this is a strategy. So find somebody you know, within your social network, within your group, um, that you can actually start making change with. Find somebody that can help hold you accountable and encourage you along the way. This can take a lot of different shapes. This can be your neighbor. This can be your partner. You know, this can be somebody that you work with. But having somebody that is um, uh, available to you to provide that, that network support um, is really valuable to hold you accountable um, along the way. So it's, you know, with quitting, that's just like finding a quit buddy. And so really it's talking about finding a, a ride buddy. Um, small steps. Um, and smoking, this would be something like cutting down the number of cigarettes. In active transportation, it might mean, you know, starting to take the bus um, a couple days a week. And or let's say you want to in integrate more walking activity. So getting off the bus stop one stop early or two stops early the next week. So making it in incremental. Lastly, this is my lovely family. My wife um, is a contemplator. Um, she is taking small steps um, by riding with our daughter to school. The other barrier for her was having a bike that worked for us. So we need to figure out not just having safe streets, which has been awesome, but also overcoming those personal barriers that make it usable for her. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. So our next presenter is Darcy Kitching. Um, Darcy is here representing Walk to Connect. She's the Boulder Program Coordinator. Hi, I am Darcy Kitching, and I am a walking fanatic. Let's hear it for walking fanatic. <laughs> 
Coloradan, and I grew up walking and hiking. And I'm also an urban planner, but I came into this work with Walk to Connect um, just by walking, taking a walk with the founder of Walk to Connect, Jonathan Stalls. This walk through my own city, it was a nine mile walk he took us on through my own city. I saw the city in a whole new way. It was so filled with kind of contemplation and appreciation for the place, and most of all, connection with other people whom I'm still walking with uh, a year later, um, that I said, I've got to do that. So I did. I got trained by Walk to Connect to be a volunteer walking movement leader, and the first walk that I developed was this walk through my own neighborhood. I, um, we really encourage leaders to share what they love about where they live. So I call this the gratitude loop. You hike up or you walk up to the top, you see this great view, and we, the, you know, that's part of my group up there at the top. We, I still take them on this walk every month, and um, it is just growing and growing because I love this place, so I get to share that with them. So I'm a member of the Walk to Connect co-op. As far as we know, we're the only walking co-op in the world. Um, we start. You can start by being a volunteer walking movement leader. Then you become a. You can uh, opt in to become a, a professional member like myself. Um, and a professional member holds contracts with municipalities and organizations. So in Boulder, I'm the Boulder program manager. We have, um, I have a, a contract with Go Boulder, the Boulder Active Transportation Agency, to do Boulder Walks work. And then I also oversee a body of volunteers who do what we call Boulder Ramblers work, which is basically our Boulder Walk to Connect chapter. Boulder is a gold-friendly walk, uh, or gold-level walk-friendly community. Um, and that's characterized by these amazing amenities that we have. We have um, 60 miles of paved multi-use paths. We've got 145 miles of natural open space and mountain parks trails. We've got 79 pedestrian and bike underpasses. And we have incredible connections to our RTD transit system. So we, when we're doing our walks, we're bringing people into these facilities, activating them, and showing them how to use all these wonderful connections. We do things like multi-use path meanders, where we just walk five miles on the multi-use paths and show how you can do that and also just where the underpasses are. So we mostly use Meetup for our Boulder Ramblers work, which is our, um, our volunteer side. That Meetup has tripled in size in the last year. We just started this last, um, in 2015, and we've grown from 100 members to 377. I was the only leader in Boulder for a while, and now we have 15 leaders in Boulder, so we're really growing, our community is growing. And everything we do, the, mo the growth that we really care about is personal growth. We, everything we do comes back to this idea of life at three miles per hour, connecting to others, to place, and to self at a natural pace. And that natural pace is different depending on who we're walking with. With our seniors, we're working with Boulder seniors to do gentle walks. Those are at a different pace than our fitness walks. Um, so we connect with others by encouraging people to get out at all times of year, in all weather. We take hikes on snowy days. We get out on the beautiful autumn days in, uh, in Boulder. And we get out on sticky summer days when people might not really want to get out. But they're coming out because they want to be with their group. Um, we're connecting people to others. We connect people to others by being playful and encouraging playing in the environment. And, um, encouraging people to share what they love. We play in the snow. We play at sunrise on a mountaintop. Um, we, we have fun getting ice cream after the end of a long hike. And sometimes we don't exactly know where we're going, but we just play and have a good time. <laughs> That's Jonathan Stalls, the founder of Walk to Connect. Most of all, we connect to others by walking to food. This is the <laughs> best way to get people out to walk. We, um, this was after a seven mile hike. Our group um, walked the length of this trail that culminated at a place with this restaurant. And we just, we sat together and had lunch, and those are our most popular walks and hikes by far. Um, so we connect people to place by working with the city of Boulder to um, show, educate people about changes to the pedestrian environment, like this tour of a new um, public art project. We do uh, walk audits with young people and older people to learn what works in the environment and what doesn't, what needs to be changed. And we, uh, we showcase the, the wonderful celebration of place that, um, that the city offers through its various programs. We also uh, connect people to place by taking them into public art projects where the artists are asking people to interact with them and by, sh by um, discovering those wonderful kind of insurgent public art projects by finding little free libraries and uh, various kinds of wayfinding practices that people have put into the environment. And we connect people to place by showing them how to connect different municipalities. So we are Boulder County wide and there are several municipalities in Boulder County. On this walk, it was an eight, a uh, little over eight miles from the city of Boulder to the city of Louisville, and we, we followed some paths that a lot of people didn't even know existed. You can actually walk all the way around Boulder County. 
So we connect people to themselves by offering opportunities also for contemplation, reflection, things like labyrinth walks, um, moments of silence on, on walks. Jonathan really emphasizes this, the importance of connecting to self so that you can appreciate the place where you are. And so we do that in a variety of ways and just invite our leaders to offer that however they want to. We connect people to themselves by asking about their stories. This is Suzanne, she's one of our leaders. She was a professional triathlete, like a lot of people in Boulder. It's a very competitive city um, for a long time, but she, her soul is nourished and nurtured by being out in nature. And so she shares that and she also shares how people can heal their bodies um, by walking properly. Um, we also connect people to themselves by offering them opportunities to um, fulfill their own personal goals. This is Dawn. She walked with us from one end of Boulder to the other on an, a 12 mile hike. Um, and she is right now at the age of 75 hiking the Camino de Santiago de Compostela in Spain. So she used that hike as a training hike of, of hers and we welcomed her into our community to do that. Um, none of this work could be done without our amazing volunteer leaders. This, this is just a few of them. Um, we get together, we appreciate each other, and we encourage them to share their passions. That's how we're really growing our community, is by reaching out. Um, we have a lot of work to do. We're not reaching everyone in Boulder, and we are, but we're on our way. We've only been doing this for a year. We, everything we do comes back to this idea of connection to others, to place, to self, and um, and that's how we're growing, and I hope that we continue to grow and grow and grow. So, thank you. <laughs> All right, our last presentation today is uh, Talia Lang. Talia is joining us from San Francisco from the Municipal Transportation Agency. Uh, she's a senior transportation planner there. Thanks so much. Good morning, guys. I'm Talia. I'm from the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency, and I'm here today to talk to you about the Rays Bikeway in San Francisco, our first Rays Bikeway, and our evaluation of this project. Um, so to start off, uh, for those of you who don't know, what is the Rays Bikeway or cycle track? Well, Rays Bikeways <laughs> are bikeway facilities that are vertically separated from motor vehicle traffic. They can be at the level of the adjacent sidewalk or set at an intermediate level between the roadway and the sidewalk. They often have buffers between the bikeway and the roadway. So these have been very effective, so they've been done before. I'm faster than it. <laughs> <laughs> they've been done before in many different cities across the U.S. Um, and internationally, there, you guys have a lot of great examples right here in Vancouver, which I am totally jealous of. Um, they've been done in places like Boulder um, and, uh, I'm sorry, and um, Portland and Cambridge, Massachusetts, Copenhagen and the Netherlands, but they haven't been done in San Francisco until now. Um, what you see here is a Market Street Raised Bikeway demonstration project. It's a one-way cycle track on a two-block section of Market Street in the inbound or eastbound direction. Um, we tested four different designs on this two block stretch, about a half a block each. Um, they each have slightly different profiles, but what they all have in common is that they're an intermediate level between the sidewalk and the roadway, and they all have a curb separating the right bikeway from the roadway. I'll walk you through each of them in uh, just a second. Um, so we really wanted to really test each of these designs and see how they would work with our public. Option A is our wide mountable curb. It has a one foot wide beveled curb between the bikeway and the roadway and it's raised about two to three inches above the level of the roadway. It's uh, six foot wide, um, seven foot wide if you include the curb. Our next option is option B, a mountable curb. It's a six inch mountable curb, beveled curb, so a little bit steeper than the previous option. Again, the bikeway is raised two to three inches above the level of the roadway, and it's six and a half foot wide, and seven foot wide if you include the curb. The next option is option C. Man, slow down. <laughs> um, a mountable curb, but it's near the sidewalk level, so very similar to the previous option, except it's raised a little bit higher, only about two inches below the level of the sidewalk, which is why we have those yellow tactile domes for ADA reasons um, on the sidewalk adjacent to the bikeway. Um, again, it's uh, six and a half foot wide. Um, last option is option D, the vertical curb, so a 90 degree curb separating the bikeway from the roadway. Um, this is similar to options A and B in that it was, it's raised two to three inches above the level of the roadway and it's six and a half foot wide. 
So, like I mentioned before, we wanted to test these four different designs and see how they are performing, so we conducted a multi-pronged evaluation, the purpose of which was to measure the level of support for race bikeways in San Francisco, to document the actual and perceived safety issues, accessibility, maintenance, constructability, and cost factors, compare findings to the previous condition on Market Street and then alternative designs, and lastly, really to guide the SFMT on how best to implement race bikeways in our future projects. Our strategy included video and staff observations. That bottom right is a clip from our, our video review, guy doing a wheelie. Really fun, <laughs> video review is awesome. Testing and interviews, online public surveys, stakeholder guided tours, uh, intercept surveys, and open comments, 311s, emails, hearing from a, a range of people. What do we find out? Level of support. Support is really mixed. There's public support for the raised bikeway. 66% of people survey were in support of installing raised bikeways in other San Francisco locations, but people had significant issues with aspects of the design and felt there was room for improvement. What do we find out in terms of the preferred design? Well, um, our, our intercept survey told us that option D, the vertical curb, was preferred by 31% of the people surveyed, making it the most preferred design, but by a very <coughs> narrow margin. Really, in all of our surveys, what we really found was we got a lot of comments and people telling us what they liked and didn't like, which leads me to our next slide. Major issues and challenges. Vehicles are blocking the bikeway. Loading's an issue. The bikeway needs clarification. People really wanted to see it painted green. Some cyclists have trouble navigating the vertical curb on this seven-foot bikeway, especially when it's crowded. So really what it comes down to, there's a big divided tension between severe curb angles to deter vehicles and gentler curbs, which allow cyclists to come in and out. Constructability and cost. Utilities and drainage really affect the physical characteristics of a bikeway. They affect the width and the, the curb types. Um, the cost of a raised bikeway can be much more expensive than a buffered bikeway and, and a painted bikeway. So really we need to weigh the construction costs and benefits when we go to implement raised bikeways. Maintenance. The, sweeping, the street sweeping machines that regularly sweep Market Street um, cannot sweep the raised bikeway. It's a little too narrow. It can't get suction. Truncated domes, uh, tactile domes, get pretty dirty and have to be manually swept because of uh, sub-sidewalk basement issues. So we're not really gaining any maintenance efficiencies from the raised bikeway. Accessibility. Accessibility community, they were generally supportive um, and liked a lot of aspects of it, but didn't like the vertical curb because they weren't able to pull close and deploy their passengers, and they didn't like the bikeway at sidewalk level because they feared cyclists entering the sidewalk. So what does this all mean? Like, what does this mean for how we're going to do things in the future? Really, what we found out is that perhaps the only way to deter vehicles in San Francisco is using some sort of vertical curb option, but it needs to be wide, and buffer, a buffer might be essential to ensure the safety of our cyclists. So we're gonna have to look at this design and, and see how we can do it with a certain width and with clear entry and exits and buffers. And since we don't have a lot of horizontal real estate in San Francisco, we're really going to need to look at less severe curb designs that may be appropriate on narrower streets, and especially in areas with high bike volumes. And then lastly, we may need to go back to basics, which is the next slide, and really look, here we go, <laughs> back to basics and look at buffered bike lanes with entry and exit brakes, which really may be more successful deterring vehicle incursion and more cost effective than raised bikeways. So in conclusion, basically pilots are really good because <laughs> you know you find out what's not working and you, you know, make some changes and modify and modify until you get it right. And what we found in San Francisco is that it's a unique city with a lot of cranks and cogs and it begs for custom design of our bike facilities to make for some really great streets. Um, what you see there, which will probably go away in two seconds, is a Burma Shave uh, campaign that we did along the raised bikeway that was a lot of fun. So thanks guys. We're going to open it up to questions now. Um, we'll, we'll pass the mic around. Maybe our presenters can just stand if you're speaking so everyone can see you. Does anyone have a question to start us off with? Yeah, for Brian, the first presenter, just some sort of takeaways from like what I'm interested in learning more about the how to put together a spot in the program, like um, some of the tips that you have for, for the, more of the programming side of it. Sure. Um, so we have a long list of projects that we're still trying to get to. It's hundreds long, and you can compile that list from 
emails from residents, from uh, just staff know-how, uh, depending on your political climate, maybe that's where another portion of the list is coming from. Um, there is no good way to really rank between them, and that's a little, where a lot of the hard work is, what are we going to do first? So um, some of these things come in packages, like maybe you're really trying to roll out green paint, um, and you can create a, a green paint package for that year. You find what you think are the most important ones and try and do that all as one package. Uh, maybe you're focusing on stop sign rotations and that sort of thing. Um, but leave room for the bigger pieces. Um, I don't know, uh, is that, maybe you've got really good safety data and you can put the, the quantitative uh, aspect to the weighting, but these aren't always actual safety problems. A lot of them are different problems. Um, I, like, I, I know which one of ones I presented on that had more collisions than the other ones, but it's not necessarily clear that that was more likely to actually be the stop sign at the beginning than the diverter at the end. So. But. And what kind of how what kind of funding is your program? Uh, about a half a million a year. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think we got two more questions here. I believe you are next. Go ahead. Yes, another question about the spot improvement program. How do you identify uh, locations that require improvement? Is there some kind of system in place is it based on complaints, uh, uh, collision data, or what is it? So that was kind of the beginning of the previous one, is like getting those ideas from resident complaints and from just staff know-how, like tying that all together. Um, yeah, I mean, if you have collision data, you could use that. And we that's how we identified, say, the, the basically four traffic circles in the city that were actually problematic in terms of collisions between people driving and cycling, as opposed to most of them, which had one or fewer uh, collision recorded in the last five years. And is that considered also gross related to volume, segment hours? Uh, yeah, I mean, and again, it's not always the most quantitative ranking system. That is definitely something you can put into practice. We have this focus on uh, what we call our metro core, so the things that are in close to downtown things that we're trying to get towards the AAA level. It's not It's not really hard numbers most of the time for us. But, okay. right. I think you're up next here. Go ahead. This is for Brian as well. <laughs> 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 okay. Just a question. I just wanted to thank you. Thank you. Um, I use my bicycle to cycle everywhere around the city, and I've really noticed those yes. improvements, and yeah. it's made a big difference yeah. for me. Uh, put together stuff before before me and during and some of the fancier stuff too. So make sure you give him some of the applause as well. <laughs> I don't know if I should take the mic back or just. <laughs> Does anybody else have a question? We just have a minute or two left here. I have a question for Darcy, and I know that your program is only a year old, but um, I I wondered if you have specific. Um, strategies for trying to reach out to, you know, greater diversity of participants? Yeah, that's definitely something that I'm working on more. We've been kind of, uh, we've been tapping into the, you know, 3,000 plus um, uh, community of Walk to Connect, which is Colorado-wide, um, but in Boulder, and, you know, it's, it's a challenge. So we, what we're trying to do um, to increase the diversity of our participation is really, um, uh, show those transit, the, the links between transit, um, things like B-Cycle, all the different uh, ways that we have for people to get around the city. And actually, I, I, my background is in participatory planning, and I really just want to go and listen, honestly. We have, we have a, a serious housing problem in Boulder in terms of affordability, and we've got a lot of people living in kind of trailer communities around the, the city, and I would really love to reach out to them and just listen and understand how they're uh, moving by foot through the city and what we can do to help their um, uh, their issues be recognized. So I don't know, I mean, it's something that I'm definitely working on. Um, we have had success work, we've, we've got a lot of partners around Boulder and we've uh, been working with uh, organizations like Growing Up Boulder to uh, reach uh, children in schools, um, to do those walk audits like I showed. And so that's the kind of stuff that we've been doing so far, but I'm, that's definitely my, my next really big issue. I think we have time for one more question. Does anyone have a question or comment? All right. Um, thanks. Thanks.